Welcome, my name is Matej, and today I will talk about solid state nuclear magnetic resonance used for operando studies of sodium ion batteries. I work as a doctoral student at the National Institute of Chemistry uh, in Slovenia at the Department of Inorganic Chemistry and Technology. I also attend the Faculty of Mathematics and Physics in Ljubljana, and my research is founded by CERIC. Uh, more specifically, I will tell you about my research motivation and goals, battery operation and degradation, hard carbon negative electrodes for sodium ion batteries, uh, something about nuclear magnetic resonance with adapted NMR Pro, and then exit operando study. So for first motivation, uh, as you probably already know, the field of research and development of batteries has been one of the most uh, active research fields in the recent years. So in this field, the researchers are no longer interested only in the individual components of batteries, stationary condition, but also interested in the insight into the operation of entire batteries. Uh, they are also interested in the long-term stability of batteries and possible mechanisms of their degradation. Uh, my research goals are the following. I introduced operando measurements with nuclear magnetic resonance and applying existing solution to the given measurement, measurement limits is the first technical part of my research focus. So an adapted probe has been bought and I have learned how to use it. The second goal is use of this operando NMR and complementary methods as, as operando EXAS, which is already developed, introduced uh, to study the stability and degradation mechanisms in the new battery systems. An applicative value of my research is then that the acquired knowledge and measurement measurement system for investigating batteries will be available to CERIC users and also other institutions for future use. Mm. So let me first tell you something about bat uh, battery operation. A battery is a multi-component device which generally comprises a cathodes, an anode, electrolyte, separator, and the, and the respective interfaces uh, between the components. So electrolytes are media that allows the ions to move between the electrodes, which are then necessary for electric current to flow out of the battery to perform work. And this separator in the middle prevent direct contact between the two electrodes, and at the same time allows ion to flow through. So upon discharge, Ions are extracted from the anode, transported through the electrolytes, and intercalated into the cathode. So ions are charge carriers. So while the ions move through the electrolyte, electrons flow through an external circuit from the anode to cathode and can perform some work. And this process is then reversed on charge. And so battery, for example, lithium-ion cells, degradates as a result of like their usage and exposure to, to environment, environmental conditions. So we are not only interested in the mechanisms inside the battery electrodes in this case, but also on the surface, such as the formation of dendrites during cycling which can lead to short circuiting, short circle, and consequently battery, uh, battery heating and also fire risk. The degradation is caused by a large number, physical and also chemical mechanisms. So, and all of this affect the different components in the cell. So this picture illustrates some of the most commonly reported degradation mechanisms in lithium-ion cell. Uh, these mechanisms are already well known in the current batteries, but certainly not in the batteries uh, under development. So these different causes, rates and, and uh, of these degradation mechanisms make them extremely um, challenging to model. So. So that's the reason that which uh, the most physics-based models focus only on the most, we say, the most dominant mechanisms, such as the formation and growth of solid electrolyte interface, 
or electronic uh, um, say contact loss through through particle cranking and this dendrite formation and all these me measurable physical effects effects of these degradation mechanisms on the cell can be then summarized in the term of three degradation modes namely loss of lithium inventory uh, loss of active anode material and then loss of active cathode material so the different degradation modes are assumed to have like a unique and measurable effect on the open circuit voltage and this degradation affect the cell ability to store energy so capacity to meet power demands and ultimately also lead to their end of life um, so current research efforts in the field of energy storage are focused on the finding alternatives to the lithium ion batteries uh, among these are also sodium ion batteries. Due to the high availability of sodium in nature, its low cost and a suitable redox potential, hard carbons are quite suitable for anodes in, uh, in uh, solid uh, sodium batteries. So, um, but however, this, the exact mechanisms of their operation rem remains uh, unknown. So hard carbons are best described as partially ordered as they contain both amorphous and graphene regions. So this combination of order in disorder uh, proves to be the best way to achieve, uh, we say, to achieve um, a good performance or sufficient high electric capacities. So in our case, we use corn cups as a precursor and uh, expose them to high temperature resulting in carbonization and finally milling is cut out to achieve a fine powder uh, so depending on the temperature the chemical structure also change ch changes so um so with elemental analysis of this carbon and of with uh, we, so we, we, with elemental analysis we can find that there, there is some carbon and a few other elements such as hydrogen hydrogen and nitrogen are mainly represented there uh, so intercalation and, and insertion of the sodium ions from hard carbon and from and into hard carbon are a focus of many recent studies. So in this study, so we, we show physical, physical and electrochemical properties of this half cell corn hub derived from hard carbon and was established with ex situ and operando solid state nuclear uh, magnetic resonance. So this gradual ordering of the hard carbon is well illustrated by scanning transmission electron uh, microscopy. It shows a gradual increase, gradual increase uh, of graphene lines at higher carbonization temperature. And on the right side is a solid state NMR measurement of the same electrode powder. Uh, a different carbonization temperature. So a mild, mild narrowing of the signal due to the ordering at higher carboniza carbonization temperature uh, is also detected with NMR. Uh, so while the mechanisms of sodium storage in hard carbon is not yet, yet fully um, understood, uh, the galv galvanostatic, on the other hand, curves provides valuable insights uh, with displacing two distinct regions. So here is one region above 0 0.y volts is a step section is evident as the potential changes. So here the potential change gradually uh, below 0 0.1 volts, but the curve reach a plateau characterized by a slower potential change. So in the slop sloping region, capacity is linked uh, to the absorption of sodium ions on defect sites. Meanwhile, the capacity uh, observed in the plateau region uh, is associated with uh, two mechanisms. Uh, one is sodium insertion uh, between graphitic layers and filling of nanopores within the carbon structure, uh, which we say quasi-metallic clusters. So although several storage, we say uh, storage models propose this explanation for the intercalation of sodium ion into the hard carbon and out, we need further insights. In the further insight is required to determine 
the specific, uh, we say specific mechanisms of sodium intercalation, and also the correlation with the region of the electrochemical discharge curves. Mm. So, so to get an insight into the operation of such complex systems as batteries, it is often necessary to use a whole range of research techniques. Uh, so the application of a non-invasive analysis tool that can follow the reaction in operando, we say, and proves real-time information is, is uh, highly desired. So NMR and EXAS are suitable candidates as they are quite complementary methods. NMR on the one side works in the range of radio waves and EXAS in the range of X-ray rays. So uh, let's look at some important advantages and disadvantages of NMR. So it enables to study of the local structure of, many, of matter at atomic level so NMR enables observation of structural species within the entire sample volume. So it's volumetric technique. So this enables to pro probe the multi-component nature of the battery at once. It also enables studying crystalline, amorphous, and liquid phases, which are, which are commonly components frequently combined in electrochemical cell. It also allows the study of local structure in the vicinity of many pre-selected types of nuclei, uh, advantage is that that commonly used battery materials often consist highly abundant NMR active nuclei, such as uh, lithium, sodium, phosphorus, and that uh, allowing the NMR spectra to be to be collected. But unfortunately, it has so far been very rarely, rarely used as operandi or methods as method that monitor batteries during the operation. So the main reason is that the sample of substances of systems studied by NMR spectroscopy are are very diff diff uh, difficult to manipulate in the strong magnetic fields in the spectrometer. Uh, samples are very uh, samples are very difficult to let's say exposure to high or high or low temperature, pressure, presence of electric current, and so on. There is also limited space in the NMR probe. So outer diameter of the probe is four to seven centimeter, and it's also it's difficult to observe nuclei of certain elements, often the nuclei of metals, such as magnesium, calcium, and especially the nuclei in paramagnetic metal ions. So, and at the end, we have often time-consuming measurements. Depending on the observed nuclei, it can be like three, four days per one measurement. So applying solution to these given limits is one of the focuses of my research. Um, the second, excess. Spectroscopy has already established as a method that allows insight in the local structure of batteries, uh, even during the operation. It's also quite similar as NMR. In addition to the latter, I would like to emphasize that the following things. It is good to, for determining oxidation states, coordination numbers, and bond distances. It also allows to study the local structure of each atom of type of atom selectively. And it enables it enables ones to observe local structure of some atoms or ions, uh, predominantly metal ions, with which NMR spectroscopy is it's much difficult. Uh, let's take at some disadvantages of EXAS. Uh, it's unable to distinguish between scattering atoms with a little difference in atomic number. Light atoms are difficult to observe. So on the other hand, NMR has no problem with this. Uh, it is time-consuming signal analysis, and it's, in my case, it's limited access to the method as we do not have it at our institute. So does NMR and EXAS have a lot of common, but methods are not limited. So both methods are not limited to crystalline substances. Uh, so exhibiting uh, the long range order. So they are also at atom specific, and on the other hand, they are uh, complementary. For example, EXAS can typically easy work with heavier atoms, where NMR is convenient for studying lighter atoms, and that's quite okay. Mm, so now we can see something about NMR. So the question is, how does NMR actually work and what kind of information they contain? So when a sample contain a large ensemble of atomic nuclei is 
placed into magnetic field, the energy of some nuclei rises and of some nuclei it falls. It rises for nuclei whose magnetic uh, moments point in the direction uh, opposite to that of the magnetic field uh, and falls for nuclei whose magnetic moments are, are along the direction of magnetic field. So the energy difference between these two energy levels depend on the strength on the magnetic field, which is a sum, sum, sum of external magnetic fields and local magnetic field. Uh, so this external magnetic field is generated by a strong magnet of the NMR spectrometer, and local magnetic fields are produced by ner nearby electrons and atoms in nuclei in the solid. Nuclei in different environments, which sense different local fields, have then different splitting. So the energy or frequency of transition between levels are different. So this energy splitting depends on also on the duromagnetic ratio of nuclei and some of external and local uh, fields. So the, base, the aim of NMR spectroscopy is to very precisely uh, measure differences in these local magnetic fields. Um, and it does this by precisely measuring the transition frequencies between these energy levels. So such a measurement gives us an NMR spectrum. Um, in this spectrum, atomic nuclei that fill different local fields give rise to signals at different frequencies at, with different shapes. Uh, actually, not only the position, but also the shape of the signal is important. From all this, for all of this, we can learn something about the surroundings of the nuclei, about the local structure. As mentioned, the shift and the signal broadening the line shape are determined by the local fields or by so-called internal spin interactions and can become really complex. Understanding how spin interactions change the signal shape and position is a major part of analyzing NMR spectra after the initial signal has been acquired. Uh, we won't go into the details here, but however, it's important to know that that determining the position and of the maxima and integrals of the spectra uh, is usually the first step. So the intensity of NMR signal is furthermore determined by the natur natural abundance of isotope under investigation, as well as concentration of nuclei within the sample, the temperature, magnetic field strength, and also sample size. All these effects, all together, are very useful because they allow the atomic nuclei to behave as a microscopic radio transmitters, sending out highly local molecular information encoded as radio waves. So the next question is, how actually, how do we measure the NMR spectra? We need a magnet that creates a strong magnetic field, a probe in which a coil is wounded around the sample. A coil brings nuclear spin system out of the equilibrium with radio frequency field and observe, measure the system response. A console that generates this radio frequency field capture and to some extent also process the signal. So this is detected as, as acquired signal or free induction decay. So one can increase this free induction decay by increasing the magnetic field or by decreasing the temperature or increasing the amount of sample. So with Fourier transformation uh, of this voltage versus time, signal results in the NMR signal. At, uh, so we say that with, so we can always say by, by Fourier transformation, 
So in BTF, this, uh, let's say, this voltage versus time signal results in NMR, signal of intensity versus uh, frequency. And we see here that therefore in the spectrum of nuclei from different environments, we obtain signals at different frequencies. Uh, in the second step, uh, we will take a look at accessories uh, that allows in situ NMR on battery solo operando. So we need electrochemical cell that consists two halves of plastic cylinder with cavities uh, for the cathode, separ cathode separator and anodes, as well as holes for connecting the current collectors. Uh, everything is pressed together and encapsulated afterwards to ensure sealing and constant pressure. The cell inside the RF coil is connected to the cycler. Uh, this is voltage, a voltage source from the bottom using highly shielded ports and cables to prevent interference uh, between the NMR and electrochemistry experiment. And here is also a picture of an adapted uh, probe for operando NMR that allows automatic tuning of the probe radio frequency during the experiment. Um, I also listed, listed here some benefits of this adapted in situ NMR probe from NMR service. Uh, this system address some, some of the operation challenges by combining a new setup uh, for connecting the electrochemical cell in the probe head, as well as automatic, uh, automatic recalibration of the electric circuits and frequency sweep. There is also added as shielded ports and cables and also the plastic cell uh, capsule design is very easy and robust due to, the, and due to this, the sample packing and orientation and also shape is, is, uh, is improved at the end. So we can see here that, no, so here is like some basics about operando, about probe, about NMR signal and everything. Now we can, uh, we can look for, uh, to, uh, for some uh, data. First, I'm gonna present ex situ part of the study. So when you start with the battery, it's 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 first step to to test it uh, how how, well, how good is the electrochemistry. In in this way, hard carbon electrodes material was tested electrochemically in a half cell con configuration against sodium metal electrode. The initial first five formation cycle at uh, current density of C over 10 were used, and then a higher current density of 1C was used for the next 100, uh, 100 cycles. So the hard carbon exhibits an initial columbic efficiency of 72%. The, this low uh, columbic efficiency result from the loss of active material in the first cycle, uh, attributed to the for, for, uh, for to electrolyte decomposition and solid electrolyte interface formation. And this a slightly decrease in capacity is noted upon transition to higher currents, density of 1C. And then we see stabilization around two, 260 milliampere hours per gram. So for purpose of NMR ex situ study, I first constructed a swedge lock cell which, with hard carbon powder and metallic sodium as counter electrode. Uh, due, due, to, due to the sensitivity to air and moisture, moisture, I assembled it in a glow box. I then cycle and stop each cell at different potential. Um, I then disassemble them in the glow box. Uh, in this way, I obtained uh, differently associated powder electrodes. I then filled the NMR rotor with the individual electrode powder, uh, and I insert this rotor into the NMR probe, which was then inserted in the NMR spectrometer. And the NMR probe rotates the sample at, we say, at magic angle relative to the direction of the external magnetic field, in my case at 20,000 hertz. Uh, and this helps us to obtain a narrower spectra and hence a better resolution when determining the different contribution in the material. So this is like major difference between liquid and solid state NMR. In liquid, you just put pipette inside magnetic fields and the molecule itself 
itself jiggling and doing the thing. But in solid state, everything is more more freezed, more rigid, rigid, rigid. So we need we need to we have solution that instead of material we we just rotate the space itself, so the rotor itself, and then simulate the liquid environment. So that's the reason that we need to spin it so fast. In this case, the spectral solid state become slightly similar to liquid, so more more narrow, and in this case, is a better uh, began better solution. Um, so this obtained spectra of sodiated and desodiated batteries were then uh, analyzed. So such approach provides information on the resulting morphologies. Uh, crystal structure and electrochemical reaction products. So here at the right um, is variation of the fractions of three different contributions with the sodiation level. And by measuring sodium NMR spectra, we obtain information about the formation of a solid electrolyte interface on the electrode surface uh, in the term of sodium fluoride and sodium carbonate. Um, however, the methods can be invasive and may significantly uh, can affect the battery's uh, battery state. So, in addition, exit methods may not capture various of metastable, intermediate, or short life uh, phases that occur during the chemical reactions. So, in this case, uh, the study was continu continued with an operando NMR measurement. This technique uses non invasive methods to observe the battery during operation. So providing real-time information on dynamics, structural changes, and processes. So we success, so success, we, we, we managed to design NMR operanda experiments and conducted measurements in the, at the NMR Center Spectrometer, Slovenian NMR Center Spectrometer at the National Institute of Chemistry. So I first assembled operando cell in a glow box and tested them on a potentiostat. So during these tests, uh, I varied the force on the electrodes uh, using spacers to achieve constant uh, contact and also optimize the electrode components to achieve the, the, the stable electrochemistry. So I then insert a working cell into the coil of the, param the probe and I then placed the probe in the NMR spectrometer. So this figure shows the spectrum of so sodium solid state operand NMR performed, as we say, it on half cell system. Uh, electrochemistry measurements are added, added on the right. So notably, the at, uh, the the uh, the the at points are the most informative. During the, the final sodiation at potential at 5 millivolts, a uh, signal emerged at around 100 ppm, indicating the formation of quasi-metallic clusters. And this is characteristics of pore filling phase. Uh, and this signal disappears upon, upon discharge, uh, upon this, this uh, upon, upon the sodiation, so charge. Uh, on the right, is electrochemistry, yes, and schematic representation of the sodium ion three part storage system assigned with different colors um, and with orange circle is assigned pore filling phase, this last part of electrochemistry. Um, and there is also one second event phenomena here. At full, dis uh, at full uh, dissociation, so at full charge, at two volts, uh, an additional peak emerge to to the next to the metallic sodium signal, indicating the formation of uh, dendrites um, on the metallic sodium surface. So that this right figure provides a peak uh, integral variation over the time for for the convoluted sodium metal signal. Uh, and here is, is, is picture, representation, illustration 
of the growth of dendrites from the surface and their impact on the NMR spectrum. So with NMR, we can distinguish these two, these two signals uh, because also the orientation, the space can influence the chemical shift. So this is quite, uh, this is quite uh, nice because then we can have separately study of this left signal. Uh, for more clear, there is an even more uh, detailed, detailed view of the operando spectrum of half cell sodium and hard carbon metal. Uh, I have divided the whole spectrum into three parts. So on the left, uh, on the left is the paramagnetic region around the sodium metal signal, and in the end you can see the formation of dendrites on the surface. In the middle is the region where I detected the formation of quasi-metallic clusters. So here you can see the signals of the contributions uh, which are already acquired a slightly paramagnetic nature. And on the right is diamagnetic region where the electrolyte and SCI signal are detected. And also the electrochemistry is added at the right end. Mm. So for conclusion, I can say that solid state nuclear magnetic resonance is one of the most powerful spectroscopy technique because it can it can provide element specific atom resolution inside in the solids through detection of the local magnetic and electric fields. Solid state NMR offer insight into the local structure, processes, and dynamics in solids. So I believe that the microscopic insight into the structure of new batteries during their operation will significantly improve our understanding of degradation of these batteries. Exit to and operand NMR are highly complementary to each other and show great potential in exploring batteries. Exit to NMR can distinguish between different solid electrolyte interface contribution on the, on the electrode surface. Operand on the other hand, can detect sodium intercalation in the active material and growth of uh, dendrites between discharge and charge. Mm -hmm. So at the end, I also want to thank my, my supervisor, Alan Mijintin, uh, and co-supervisor, Andras Kreintz, and also my um, CERIC uh, Department of Energetic Chemistry and Technology, Department of Material Chemistry and also Slovenian NMR Center for the use of the spectrometer. I would also thank the, to Remate uh, for the opportunity to give this uh, webinar. And of course, thank you for your attention.